Well, John, I cannot take credit for what the Chinese did to bring the cost of uh, silicon solar cells down, but uh, thank you anyway. Um, uh, so yeah, today I'll talk about something uh, new for my uh, research group. Uh, uh, we've uh, been having a lot of fun making uh, windows with dynamic tinting, and there's really no better way to start than to show you the windows. And um, uh, on the left, it's in its transparent state, and then you see that um, we can put the window in a, a partially tinting state, and it's got a nice uh, neutral gray color to it. Uh, and then you see that um, uh, after about a minute, uh, the, the, the window absorbs almost all of the light, and um, it's even dark enough uh, for uh, privacy applications. We're doing this by uh, electroplating metal, uh, which is very effective at uh, blocking light. Uh, and then you see that we can uh, strip the metal and, and make the window go transparent again. And uh, we've cycled these windows um, uh, up to 5,500 times uh, without observing uh, degradation. Uh, so that, um, in a nutshell, that's what we've done. Uh, but let me, let me step back and, 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 and motivate uh, the application and, and tell you um, the other approaches that uh, people are uh, taking to it. Um, so that one's one of my least favorites, uh, the, the, the metal slat blind. Um, I've never seen a science fiction movie um, in, in which the spaceships have um, metal blinds in them. And uh, it's hard to imagine that in 10 to 15 years we'll be going around in self-driving vehicles and pulling on strings to uh, rotate uh, metal slats um, when we have too much glare um, in, in a room. Uh, it's about as ridiculous as, as putting that on your glasses and, and, and using it instead of sunglasses. Uh, it's obviously much better to just adjust the tinting, and, and you see an example of this over here. And, and, and the great thing about that is that you can still see through the window. Blinds and curtains um, block your view. And, and we have a beautiful campus here, and um, uh, so many people have their blinds closed uh, to, because of the glare, and, um, and their view is, is, is lost. So it's clearly... Uh, uh, preferable to just adjust the tinting uh, without blocking the view. And um, uh, you know, from an energy savings point of view, um, you can, um, uh, studies have shown that you can um, save about 20% on the um, uh, heating and, and cooling and ventilation uh, costs and, uh, and, and also um, uh, lighting. Uh, you can um, you know, optimize the flow of lighting um, into a, a building and, uh, you know, with, with this kind of a technology. Uh, but I think you can't even fully capture the, the, the value here. People just enjoy uh, natural lighting and the future is certainly towards having more and more uh, window area um, in buildings uh, and a, a, a solution to, um, to glare is, is certainly needed. And um, here's, um, this, this is from the VIEW uh, website. They're, they're one of the leading companies in developing um, dynamic glass, and, and you can see a window switching here. And, and one of the things that I think is really crucial for um, uh, saving energy is that it can be automated. Uh, in, in practice, on a cold winter night, we could all put our window blinds down to, to um, uh, hold heat in at night. But I think it's safe to say that approximately zero people on our campus uh, you know, do that on a nightly basis. Uh, so it needs to be automated. And if you look on this um, video, I, I didn't think it was appropriate to, to play a five or six minute um, a commercial here in the seminar. But you can look at it yourself. And they talk about how you could have a light sensor on top of a building and a computer would have the data from that. It would also have um, weather data. It would predict when clouds are coming, and it would know the layout of the building, and it would very intelligently um, optimize the um, tinting, uh, first prioritizing uh, comfort for the people inside, minimizing glare, um, particularly on computer screens, um, and then uh, prioritizing energy efficiency. But of course, you would always be able to override it and uh, you know, get whatever tinting uh, you wanted. So um, uh, since our work has come out a few weeks ago, um, a lot of people have been asking various questions and, 
the number one question is, um, how are our windows different from photochromics? So I'll start there. Um, I'm wearing um, uh, a pair of glasses with, with photochromic lenses. Uh, they go dark um, when they're exposed to uh, UV light. And so it's great. I go outside, my, my glass is darkened. Um, there's no, no switch, no, no power or anything like that. Those are advantages. Um, however, uh, they won't darken in a car because uh, car windows um, have UV filters and uh, so there's no UV light uh, to trigger the glasses uh, to go dark. Um, and you just don't have control um, and they're not dark enough. Uh, if, if you uh, were to try to go skiing with a pair of these glasses, it's, it's just too um, bright. Uh, the, the, the glasses don't have a wide enough uh, dynamic range. Um, and, and so, um, uh, and then, yeah, for buildings, um, you, you really want to have that uh, control. Um, and so photochromics are, are not a great solution. Uh, technology that's already being used in um, high-end cars, I think there's, there's four companies, including Mercedes, um, that, that, that puts dynamic glass in their sky roofs. And some of them use suspended particle devices. And here, they, uh, they're just particles in there that can scatter light. And um, with a, a, an applied field, the particles will line up and um, light is able to go in between some of these columns of um, uh, particles. Um, and, um, and, and so it works reasonably well, uh, but it's inherently um, hazy. Um, uh, in, in, in both of these states, light is scattered somewhat and um, it, it's not ideal for sky roofs and it's just not acceptable. Uh, for the uh, windows in uh, uh, buildings. Uh, another technology that um, it's, it's been available for at least 30 years, but I personally have never seen it, um, which, which means that it certainly hasn't caught on very well, are liquid crystals. And um, these are molecules where the refractive index is different in one direction compared to the other. And if you line the molecules up, you can get a state where light goes through unscattered and, and it's clear, and in the other state it scatters. Um, but it, it, it really doesn't work for energy efficiency. It's just for um, privacy. All, all it really does is scatter up uh, the, uh, the, the light. Uh, so you might use it if you want privacy in a, a, a conference room, uh, but it doesn't really solve the, the, the problem uh, that, that a lot of people want to solve. The, the most um, uh, 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 promising solution uh, and th that the biggest companies are pursuing are so-called electrochromics. And these are materials like tungsten oxide that um, change color uh, when they're reduced. And so you can have a device where there's um, two conducting um, electrodes, uh, something like indium tin oxide. And on one of them, you have the electrochromic material on the other, you, have, you also have a material that's capable of being oxidized and reduced. And, um, and then you have an electrolyte in there with uh, the, the ions. And you can apply a voltage and um, uh, put the lithium into the tungsten oxide and, and, and darken it. Um, and then you, uh, when you want to, you can apply the opposite voltage and, uh, and, and make it go uh, clear again. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the biggest companies are using uh, tungsten oxide, and um, uh, it's, a, it's a very durable material. Everything in their stack is um, inorganic. Um, a, a test they like to run are 50,000 cycles under one sun at 85 degrees C, uh, and they are able uh, to, to pass that test, and, and they're expecting um, to have 20, 30, 40 year lifetime um, uh, based on that accelerated uh, testing. Uh, but but uh, I think if, if you ask the question, wait a minute, they have it, they have a window that switches well, uh, why don't all the buildings have this? And um, a big answer is that it's, uh, it's, it's around $50 uh, per foot squared. And a lot of that is all of these layers are sputtered um, in, in, in high vacuum tools. And um, there's, there's microns of, um, of, of material there. And also, um, if there's a pinhole, uh, the window is unacceptable. You just can't have a spot that um, uh, doesn't change color. It's too noticeable uh, when the windows are in their uh, dark state. 
And um, it's, it's challenging to make large windows in a, in a sputter tool. Not impossible, but um, it, it, it does bring the yield down. And, and ultimately, I think that um, uh, adds to the uh, costs. Um, and, and so that's probably the main reason uh, that, the, that the technology hasn't really exploded. Uh, there is a lot of interest. Um, three of the biggest players uh, are Canestral, VIEW, and SAGE. And um, you know, Canestral has raised at least 100 million, VIEW uh, up around 650 million. Uh, uh, SAGE Glass is also very large, um, and they, they were acquired by St. Gobain. Um, there are other smaller uh, startups as well. Um, so you can see there's, there's starting to be some excitement. Uh, but we were also very surprised that um, hardly any professors uh, work in this space. And um, this is a 40-year-old technology. And uh, it does have some inherent flaws. Like, it's, it's not color neutral. Uh, the, the windows let through a little bit of blue light in the dark state. And um, a lot of people we've talked to find that uh, unacceptable. Um, and the, and the you know, expense is relatively high. Um, arguably, the most successful company is Gentex, and um, they use an electrochromic molecule, methyl uh, viologen. And I think they, they made a very clever uh, choice of where to start their business. They, they do rear view mirrors uh, that have a sensor, and if someone um, is blinding you from behind, it'll sense that and it'll darken uh, the, uh, the mirror. And they do about 1.5 billion um, in sales. Uh, someone told me this, and I said, and this is John Reynolds, and I said, John, how come I've never seen this? And um, we walked outside, and it only took him about 20 seconds to um, find these cars. If you don't have a, a lever at the bottom uh, to rotate your mirror, then, then you probably have um, this technology uh, in, in your car. Um, and then uh, they're also doing the windows in the, uh, the Dreamliner. Uh, so if you've flown one of those recently, you probably noticed that there's a switch and, um, and, and you can adjust the tinting here. And um, people really uh, uh, like this, again, because you can still see uh, through the window and get the view um, even uh, when it's in the darkened state. Um, and the pilot has the ability to make all the uh, windows go clear, which they're required to do by law uh, when they land um, the airplane. And if they want the cabin to go dark, because most people are trying to sleep, um, they, they have the ability to make the whole cabin go dark. But then people can override it um, with their own uh, switch if, if they want. Um, I um, made my trip home from Europe a little longer than it needed to be a couple of months ago so that I could get on a Dreamliner. <laughs> and, um, uh, the, the other uh, passengers remarked on my enthusiasm for the window. <laughs> and um, I, I took quite a number of pictures and uh, videos. And I would say there's a lot of room for improvement here. Um, the window takes minutes to switch. And so everyone just pushes the button over and over and over again uh, because they don't think that the window um, is working. Um, and I don't know how they got that photograph because it's not that dark. Uh, it didn't seem anywhere near that dark um, when, when, when I took the pictures. And it's clearly blue. In fact, this is what my hand looks like when the window is in the clear state. And that's what my hand looks like um, with the, the filtered blue light. They only get away with this because the sky is blue and people, uh, uh, you know, it's not so ridiculously uh, uh, noticeable. Uh, so they're clearly, um, their needs, and, and we, we, we've, we've talked to window companies and, and yeah, they, they need a better color uh, to put this into homes and, um, and, and to put it into um, to, to office buildings. So to overview where the, the, where the needs are, um, you, you want uniform uh, uh, switching. And um, let, me, let me elaborate on why this is a challenge. Um, and, and, and I'm going to, you know, full disclosure, we're going to show you that it works awesome at a small size. It's challenging when it's large, because when it's large, you're drawing current, a lot of current. And that means you have a voltage drop across your transparent electrode. And when you don't have the same voltage everywhere, then it doesn't switch at the same speed everywhere. 
And so right now, um, you know, the really large windows, they take about 20 minutes uh, to, to switch. Uh, that would be a good problem to solve, although we're told that for a lot of buildings, people would accept that. Um, however, for cars, they need it to switch very quickly. Um, and so, yeah, speed is nice, um, but uh, the, the high, tr high contrast and color are really important. And um, uh, particularly, some, sometimes you need privacy, sometimes you don't. If you need privacy, you have to go below 0.1%. Um, and uh, a lot of the technologies are not able uh, to go that low. Uh, of course, you need it to be very uh, durable. You'd like it to not draw power um, unless you're switching it. Um, and then it's very important that there be low haze. You, you, know, you want a nice, clear uh, view. So we decided to take a completely uh, different approach to solving this problem. Uh, metals are um, very attractive uh, for a blocking light. Only need 20 to 30 nanometers of metal to almost completely uh, uh, block light. Um, and then um, I, I worked on organic semiconductors for 20 years and tried to build solar cells and make them last for 25 years. This time I decided to use metal. Um, metal uh, can handle UV light, it can handle heat, um, it's not going uh, uh, to degrade. Um, and you're going to see here that uh, we just take a transparent electrode and inject a gel electrolyte on it. So it's very, very inexpensive. And um, I'm reluctant to put out cost numbers at this stage in the research, but I think it should be significantly cheaper um, than a, an electrochromic device with several microns of sputtered material. So um, uh, Chris Barile was um, a postdoc in the group. He's now a professor at the University of Nevada. And uh, he brought the electrochemistry um, uh, uh, expertise uh, that our team needed to be successful. And um, he put together this table of candidates that, um, that we could use. And at the bottom, you have um, some metals uh, that, that would be easy to reduce. But uh, Chris pointed out they can oxidize, and, and, and it's, they're, they're not so reversible. Um, the opposite of that, uh, you'll never oxidize gold or platinum or palladium, uh, but you can probably guess um, why we don't want to use those. They're very expensive. Um, and in between um, are, are some metals um, that are attractive in, in every regard. Uh, we decided we'd start with copper because um, people probably know more about electroplating copper than any other metal. Um, but copper, as you know, is, is reddish, and we wanted a neutral color. So uh, we needed to put another metal in. Uh, we started with lead um, because um, uh, lead is very well understood for, for car batteries. And um, we got the message uh, very, very clearly that people did not want lead um, in their uh, windows. Uh, so we moved on uh, to silver. And um, most of what I'll show you today is um, uh, an, an alloy of copper and silver. Uh, I think this SEM here is, is actually copper lead, um, and um, this is just, it's a, these are ions in, 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 in water. And one of the first things we learned is that if you try to plate um, these metals on ITO, um, you, you don't get uh, perfectly uniform coverage. If you look in, in an SEM, um, you, you see wide spacing uh, in between the crystals, and uh, ultimately the light um, just goes in between uh, the, the crystals, and uh, so it, it doesn't work um, great. Um, and uh, we also found that um, as we would cycle it more and more, we'd get a very different uh, morphology. And so um, if we just kept uh, cycling it, plating for 60 seconds, stripping for 60 seconds, uh, the minimum transition, transmission would change considerably over time. And so basically that, that first generation didn't work very well. And then Chris um, added some platinum nanoparticles um, using um, this uh, molecule here with carboxylic acid to anchor to the ITO and a thiol to anchor to the platinum. And uh, we got dramatically better uh, results. Um, and if, if, you might, if you ask the question maybe, why didn't people do this a long time ago? 
Uh, people did do this a long time ago, but they didn't use the platinum. And um, the platinum is, is, um, is really helpful uh, for um, a, a, a lot of the uh, properties. And now you see we have a much higher nucleation density. Um, and as we're plating further, you're getting more and more uh, metal and, and moving to um, a more opaque uh, window. Uh, and now when you cycle it a thousand times, um, you see that you're getting a very um, consistent uh, morphology. Uh, we believe after each stripping cycle, we've completely removed the metal and then we're um, uh, starting um, all over again. Um, and so here is um, the, uh, when we do an experiment where we, we plate for 60 seconds and then strip for 60 and plot the maximum transmission and the minimum, um, it, it, it's, it's very stable. Um, there is uh, some conditioning of the electrolyte that occurs at first and then, it, then it's, um, you know, it's very stable. Later, later I'll show um, even more cycles. This, right now it's not yet a window. This is actually in a, in a beaker and I'll, I'll show you the window um, in, a, in a couple of slides. Um, here is the transmittance versus time. And you see it just as we plate more and more metal, the, um, the transmission goes down. So you can, you can just stop when you get the transmission that you want. Uh, and an important thing is we, we can go uh, really quite low. Uh, by plating a lot of uh, metal. With the electrochromics, there's only so much lithium that can go in, um, and then you're done. And if you um, try to make an extremely thick electrochromic to get a high darkness, uh, it's getting expensive, and it's also getting hard for the lithium to go into such a thick uh, film. Um, here you see the, um, the spectrum. So up top, that would, that's essentially just the spectrum of the uh, of the indium tin oxide electrode. And then as it's getting darker, uh, we're keeping a nice um, uh, flat uh, spectrum. And really the, the cover slide you saw, it's a, it's a very nice um, uh, black uh, color. Um, and then as we um, uh, strip it, uh, you just go right back uh, to the original uh, transparency. Over here, you see what happens if we plate metal and then remove the power source. Uh, nothing happens. The metal stays put, and then after a day, we stripped it, and, um, and, and of course, the metal ions will not just spontaneously plate on there. And so um, it draws no power um, uh, unless you're actively uh, switching the device. So it's a very, very low um, overall uh, power consumption. Um, here's how we, um, uh, the process flow to make a window. You, you, you take the ITO coated glass and put a rubber um, edge seal on there. It's probably not the perfect material, but it's what we use to package solar cells and uh, it, it worked pretty well for a prototype. Um, we put some, uh, some uh, uh, copper tape uh, around the edge here um, and put more uh, rubber on put um, a, a second piece uh, of, of, of glass over that, uh, inject uh, the, um, uh, the, the gel electrolyte. Um, here we're, we're using um, as a, sort of as a thickening agent, um, hydroxyl ethyl cellulose. And uh, I've been informed that this is hair gel, so I can no longer say that I've never used hair gel. Uh, <laughs> just don't use it for what most people use it for. And um, so that's how we make the, the window. And um, here's a video. Uh, I think this is 2x speed. Uh, so you see the window go dark. And then uh, we'll strip it here in a little while. And there it strips. And you can see it did, it, it stripped at the edges a little bit faster uh, than it stripped um, at the uh, uh, center. And uh, uh, here's some of the optics um, uh, uh, measured by Dan uh, Slotkovich. And um, the, uh, here's the transmission. <clears throat> and so uh, in, the, in the clear state, it's, it's fairly clear in the visible. Um, out in the infrared, um, the, um, the TCO blocks. In fact, the, the, that just the TCO is, um, is sort of a bare bones, low E uh, coating. Um, and then, um, in, uh, you know, of course, we can plate for different amounts, but for this one particular plating, 
uh, we've got a, a fairly flat 10% uh, transmission. Um, and then uh, we wanted to know, are we reflecting the light or are we absorbing the light? Um, and the answer is we're reflecting a little bit, you know, maybe 10%, uh, but mostly uh, we are absorbing uh, the, the light. Um, and um, it's not completely obvious why that would be the case. Uh, I mean, after all, mirrors are made uh, with metal. Um, but uh, because of the roughness and the nanoparticle nature, um, it, it, the light is uh, likely being scattered a lot, and there are many plasmonic uh, resonance, resonances in there. Um, and so we're mostly getting uh, an, an absorption. And um, it, uh, it, 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 there are some people who have said, well, we, you know, don't you want to reflect the, the light and, and keep the heat away? Um, but it turns out that for most applications, um, there are some limits on how much reflectance, like in Singapore, you're not allowed to reflect more than 30%. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, absorption um, is uh, preferred. Um, originally, like when we conceived of the project, um, we used Beer's Law to um, calculate um, how thick the metal was going to have to be. Um, but Beer's Law really turns out not to apply here. Be Beer's Law would have been the red curve. Um, and, and the reason is most of the light that's getting through um, isn't going through the metal. It's going in between uh, the metal particles. And um, taking into account um, uh, how much area we had between the particles and assuming 100% transmission there, we, we were able to come up with a simple model that um, uh, was able to explain the, the data. Um, and I would say there's good and bad news associated with that. The, um, the good news is I, uh, I think our windows look more uniform because um, the Beer's Law curve is really steep. And you can see that if you had just one nanometer more metal in one place than another, um, you'd have a noticeable transmission. Uh, so I think the shallower curve makes the window look more uniform. Um, on the other hand, if we, um, if we could plate uniformly, we would block light more effectively, and that would mean we could plate less metal, which would mean less current, and that would mean less voltage drop, and that would mean less irising. So we'd, we would be able to switch the window, uh, we, you know, bigger windows faster um, if we can uh, learn how to plate the metal uniformly. Uh, so that's something we'll uh, think about. And uh, yeah, here's the durability uh, for our copper, um, silver, gel, electrolyte window. Um, after 5,500 cycles, um, we, you know, we needed the potentiostat for other experiments. Um, we, we weren't seeing um, any, any signs of um, uh, degradation with, with cycling. Uh, we still need to do things like higher temperature and um, uh, UV light, um, but we don't seem to have the problems that you might expect with batteries. And the reason um, is in a battery, you would be um, repeatedly um, intercalating lithium in and out, and, and you keep expanding and contracting the material, and you can get failure. Um, we don't have anything like that here. And we also don't have a metal that we're completely um, uh, tearing down and then uh, uh, replating. Uh, so it seems to cycle uh, uh, quite well. So to, to wrap up, compared to other electrochromics, um, uh, we think some of the big advantages are that it's, um, it, it's gray in the partially tenting state and then black when it's fully um, opaque. And uh, I'll just say for now, cheaper. I, I, um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the cost is going to be, but um, I think it'll be well under $50 per square foot. Um, and I think we can get a higher um, range because we can, we can make our windows uh, uh, darker than, than most of the um, electrochromics. Uh, so I think uh, you know, sort of the challenges that we're working on now, um, I'm not going to say how, but um, we're, we're trying to figure out how to make these windows switch really quickly when they're large uh, without um, irising. And, um, uh, and, and we need to um, uh, do all of the long-term uh, stability tests uh, because the, 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 these windows will need to last 30 to 40 uh, years. So I really want to thank uh, an excellent team uh, for, um, for doing all of this work. 
Um, I've never actually seen them wear these uh, sport coats and ties, um, uh, but uh, maybe they put them on or maybe they photoshopped it. But um, uh, I think most of them are um, uh, in the audience. And um, yeah, Chris, Chris is now at um, Nevada, and uh, there'll be some new chemistry we'll announce next year that um, uh, Tyler and, and Michael and uh, Teresa have been developing uh, this summer. Uh, and I really want to thank um, the Stanford Precourt Institute uh, for Energy uh, for, for, for funding this. Um, uh, National Science Foundation did not get excited about this. And um, uh, two, 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 of the, two of them have fellowships, and, and so we were able to really go a long way with a little bit of money. And um, now, now that it's working, uh, people are a lot more excited about it. So we really appreciate uh, the seed grant. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to answering your questions. So thanks for leaving so much time for questions. I think that's great. Uh, by tradition, we actually start with student questions. So any student questions, comments? And, sir. Listen by metal battery, and uh, there will be more. Uh, when you are placing a metal on a uh, reactor, there will be dangerous problem, and the dangerous you are sorting the two reactors. Is this problem existing in the smart window case? No, we. Um we, uh, we don't see dendrites, and because we didn't see them, I haven't had to learn that much about them. But uh, my understanding is there's some layer that grows on the electrode that, whose name I can't remember. And sometimes you can punch through it, and you get the dendrite. Uh, we don't have any such layer. And um, I mean, you, you saw our SEMs. You saw the, um, you know, the way it, uh, it grows. Way in the back. Mike, how, how good is the control between on and off? Can you stop at some partial transmission fairly reliably? Yeah, we can stop anywhere we want along the way. Um, in an application, I don't know if, um, if it would, well, you, could, you can integrate, probably what you would do is integrate the current, um, and, and that would be telling you how much you had deposited. Um, possibly there'd be a sensor, um, but uh, probably you would integrate the, um, uh, the, the, the current to know when to uh, stop. And then a, a little bit of a problem, if you go, let's say you go down to 10, and then you want to come back up to 40, we have to go back up to 90 and then down. We need to strip it and, and, and start. You saw how it irised. Um, now, of course, even that, we stripped too fast. Maybe, you know, maybe if we worked on the right procedures, we could work that out. But right now, we would take it all the way back clear and then uh, go to the new setting. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, uh, what is the highest level of transmission, I mean, the maximum transmission versus the minimum transmission that you achieved, actually, with this device? Uh, you have shown some data where when you did the 500 cycles, you showed data going from 80% down to 20. Mm -hmm. um, and towards the end, we saw actually a slight rise of the, of the transmission, you know, on this curve. Uh, so what is the, the lowest level of transmission? Because you said you, you could achieve it mm -hmm. really dark. Uh, yeah, so what is the number there? Uh, I mean, Dan, what's the lowest we've ever gone? So, I mean, we go, we basically get down to resolution maximum that's worse. Like, we can go, because if we play long enough, we just basically have a solid layer of metal, right? Um, and as long as you have a solid layer of metal, you're below 0.01%. Okay, but, but in this case, what would be the higher, the, the maximum transmission? So it's, it's going to be the transmission of ITO, and, you know, so around 90. And then, yeah, when we, I mean, we've only done a handful of these cycling tests and um, just to kind of make it run a little faster we only darkened it down to about 25 percent and we just haven't had time to do a cycling where we're going down to say one you know we, what we need to do is get a whole bunch of channels um, 
you know, so that we can test a large number of, of devices. Okay. And my second question is, I'm sorry, maybe. My second question was related to, so I'm sure you don't have the answer for that, but uh, just trying. If you take a, a larger sample, which you don't have now, um, what would be the, um, uh, how, how would it darken? I mean, would, would you see actually going from your burst bar on the side towards actually the center? Or would it be actually too fast to show actually any uh, non-uniformity in the way it darkens? Well, if, if you just take our window the way it is right now and you make it a meter by a meter and, and you don't change anything else and you try to run it at the same conditions, it's probably going to plate um, you know, roughly a few inches on the outside and um, it's not going it, to plate very well in the center of a window that large. So you're going to have to do one of two things. You're going to have to run the window slower um, and, and accept a lower current so that there will be a smaller voltage drop. And that, that's what most of the companies are doing with the conventional electrochromics. Um, or we need a significantly better electrode, and we're working on that. Okay. Up here on the left, and then back. Yes, okay. yes uh, There is quite a bit of absorption across the entire uh, light spectrum. Mm -hmm. So my question is, the, the absorbed energy has to heat up the window, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the window heats up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when the transmission is very very low, so it would re radiate like a, at least like a black body equally in both directions of the window. <coughs> so the space inside the window in the building does get heated up. So have you guys measured the temperature rise of the window as a function of transmission? No, we haven't. Um, I'm I'm sure that uh, the the companies that are further along have done that a lot and. Um, I have heard that they will often, um, uh, in a, they'll have a double pane window and the dynamic um, part, part will be with the pane of glass that is on the outside and then they'll put a low E coating on the other pane to, um, to catch that uh, radiation. We had one back up on the left and then down here. Tell us about the changes going on at the counter electrode. Right. Um, so it's, um, I mean, right now it's, uh, it's, it's copper tape out on the edge. Um, we have made some bigger windows and uh, we, we use a, um, like a copper uh, mesh um, and that works really well. And uh, you actually, it's fine enough that you don't, you don't really see it very well. Um, it, yeah, you, 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 you can't just have the counter electrode be on the edge for a one by one meter. And so um, we're, yeah, we're working on a counter electrode grid um, that um, will be very hard to see. And, and uh, we've, we've, we have metal lines that, um, uh, I mean, you, 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 you look at them really hard. You have to get the lighting at just the right angle, um, you know, to be able to see them. Um, and, it, and it, you know, so it can work as the counter electrode. What's the most exciting part of this project for you so far? Uh, it, it's it's um, it's hard to hard to pick one moment, but um, it's it's been fantastic. Uh, I mean, it, this project is is only a little more than a year old, um, and and we've gotten this far. I've certainly never operated at this speed uh, before, and and sort of knock on wood, we haven't uh, encountered problems that we couldn't solve yet. Uh, so you know, the whole thing um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the platinum, <clears throat> platinum treatment? Are you actually passing charge through these platinum species when you're doing your electroplating? Or if you know what effect that's having on the, the deposition? Um, well, yeah, I think it's fair to say that current almost has to be going through the ITO and, and then through the platinum. Um, and, and that the metal is, you know, being plated off of the uh, platinum. And um, 
I, um, I'm not a very good chemist, and I've asked quite a number of chemists why platinum is the best catalyst for pretty much everything, and no one's been able to explain they it in know. terms yeah. that I could so understand. Yeah. Um, but even I know that platinum is a good catalyst, and right. uh, it works. Um, I don't know what you know more uh, Triple to say things, about it right. than that. How significant is the power requirement to switch the windows? And if you were able to change the design such that it required more power, but you could, you could cycle more quickly or go for a larger area, would that be an issue? I mean, power consumption is really not an issue at all here. The, the only application I can think of where it might be an issue is eyeglasses. And um, even there, we calculated a pretty good number of switches off of a battery that could reasonably be fit in the, in the size of the glasses. Um, for the other applications, it's, it's just not going to be an issue at all. Now, maybe the fact that it needs any power is an issue just because, um, well, I mean, you've, you've either got to wire it up, and, and there's some, especially in a retrofit situation, there'd be costs associated with that. Or, you know, people are thinking about um, integrating solar cells and batteries into the uh, windows. There's a, uh, from Princeton, there's a paper in Nature Materials a couple months back on a um, transparent UV solar cell um, combined with um, an, an electrochromic. Uh, um, but it's um, completely negligible amount of power, really, and, and it's more... Um, yeah, the, the issues are more of the things I talked about, like um, um, just, you know, uniformity and, and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so I guess we're talking about this, like everyone should have these windows in like a, just like a few years or so. Like, do you think that it would be possible to add this gel on existing windows in some way? Or are you, do you think that, I mean, you don't, usually don't change the windows until like 50 like, do you think there could be a way to just use the windows that are there and add something, or do you have to have a new window installed? I mean, it's certainly more challenging when you retrofit, um, but you could imagine. Um, I don't see any reason why we can't do this on uh, flexible um, uh, plastic or flexible glass, and and then have an adhesive, um, you know, so, such that you can, uh, you know, apply it. Um, on there, um, it, I, I, I suspect that it would have its challenges, and, and I've, I've had to think about that in the context of solar a lot. And it's dramatically easier to make something in a factory, um, you know, than it is to do out in the in the field. Um, but but you could imagine uh, trying to, to to do that. I, I think some are picturing it almost like a um, a window blind that isn't even attached to the glass. Um, so now it's just a window blind that can go from transparent to, um, to opaque. Yeah, one of, one of the fun things about the product, it spans so much. There's the electrochemistry and there's the, the nano optics, and then it goes all the way over into design and architecture, and there's, um, there's, there's so many different things you can imagine doing uh, with, with dynamic glass. Actually, since I see no more hands, uh, seeing our good friend Diane Gurnick, former California Energy Commissioner, sitting here on the second row next to Sally, I do remember reading in some of your materials um, a statement that it might be possible with this technology to save 20% on building heating and cooling. So what's up with those numbers, and where are you in that kind of reckoning? We have Sally's got people who could probably help with those kinds of assessments. I'm only reading other people's papers and, and <laughs> reporting the number that uh, I, 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 uh, I, can't, I can't say that I've had the time you know, to think about it. And I see the numbers varying a bit, and it obviously depends on um, uh, how many windows you have and, and what direction they're pointed and, and, a, and a number of things. But, um, but the studies seem to show you know, numbers. Um, <coughs> Certainly within that zone of t of ten to thirty percent um, uh, energy savings. Diane, two non questions. Um, do you have any sense of the possible timing, if everything goes well, mm -hmm. from when you might actually try a real world demonstration prototype 
And do you envision, again, hypothetically thinking about the cost, that this would be something that you would just put when you're installing new windows, or that you might be able to actually have it, um, I think you heard a moment ago, you made me blind, something that with all the existing windows it could be added to? <coughs> Well, I, I, um, I, I, I think that this could develop um, relatively uh, quickly, certainly compared to what I'm used to with solar cells. Um, I think the manufacturing process is not going to be as, um, as, as difficult. Um, there is some infrastructure out there. That, um, the fact that other dynamic window companies are paving the way and building the industry and you know getting the architects thinking about it um, is is great and and is likely going to speed things up for people that come in uh, uh, later and um, I uh, you know one of the things that I'm I'm pretty sure that Jim Sweeney would agree with me is that um, people usually won't buy these products that improve efficiency. Um, just because of the energy savings or the cost. Um, usually they're going to buy it because there's something else about it that they really like. And I think we absolutely have that here. Um, I, I suspect that most people picking these windows won't even think um, you know, about the energy savings. It, 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 it just would look so much better. Or, you know, imagine imagine a, 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 a beachfront restaurant where people go to have dinner and watch the sunset, but they're just completely blinded. Um, you know, the ability to go in and dim it, um, you know, would, would, would be wonderful. And I think, um, I, I, I think people would be willing to retrofit. Or, you know, maybe people who weren't willing to upgrade to double pane windows, now they would um, because um, it's, just, it's just more compelling. You know, it's going to look so much nicer. Um, you know, with that. Um, so I, I, I think some people will choose to retrofit, but it's always easier to have it look just right and be perfect, you know, when you designed the building from the beginning, you know, to have the, the dynamic windows. Okay, great. We're just about out of time. So I think if you guys want to save your questions for after, uh, that would be good. We had a couple of hands go up. Uh, at this point, uh, I want to remind the uh, students taking this class for credit to initial the <coughs> attendance list in the back of the room where Ari is now. And I'd like to thank Mike uh, one last time for both an interesting talk and <laughs> stimulating interesting questions.